Next up for day two of the Did God Release a Conference is part numero dos of Dr. Owen Strand's previous lecture. Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to the Did God Really Say conference. My name is Owen Strand. I'm the provost and research professor of theology at Grace Bible Theological Seminary in Conway, Arkansas. My session now is titled Dust Off Your Boots, What to Do When Your Church Goes Woke, when it embraces the ideology, the, the lie that all of the West is drenched in systemic racism. I've responded to that ideology after defining it extensively in my book, Christianity and Wokeness. There are other talks I've given on wokeness that you can find online if you would like to do so. So what I'm not going to do in this session is, is outline that, is walk through that. A number of my fellow presenters, eminent uh, thinkers all, have already engaged different elements of critical race theory, social justice, and wokeness. I'm not doing that now. What I'm doing is trying to answer a question I frequently get which is, what do I do if my church is getting woke? How do I address this? Uh, what should I do? I have been asked this numerous times after doing talks on wokeness and after publishing the aforementioned book. And so I thought I would take time in this session to give you more practical thoughts on this question. What I want to do, though, first is walk through a passage of Scripture, and then I'll get to some practical application. Let's begin, then. In a niceified culture like ours, we're all tempted to just manage one another's emotions. In such an emotion-driven culture, truth leaves the back door. In such a context, needed discussion driven by the truth and even confrontation rarely happens. When you embrace a niceified culture where everybody treats one another with kid gloves, what happens is that if there is going to be a confrontation, it occurs in typically one of two ways, either a seismic blowout where somebody shocks you and uh, rages on you, really, or passive-aggressive hinting, somebody dropping hints that all is not right. Why is one reason they would do this? One reason they would do so is because you are in a post-truth, niceified culture where people can't have gracious convictional conversation, where sin cannot be graciously raised as an issue, talked through graciously, I repeat myself, and handled. No, when a, tru when a truth-driven culture changes to a post-truth culture, one casualty of that switchover is that nobody tells the truth relationally. And that means that there are sins, and there are failings, and there are patterns that go unaddressed, well, mostly unaddressed, you will still have an outbreak of emotion in a post-truth culture like ours in the West in 2021. But as I said, you'll typically have it either in the form of a massive uproar or in the form of a series of passive-aggressive maneuverings. But the Scripture gives us something better than all that, doesn't it? The Scripture prescribes a truth-driven culture. What does Ephesians 4.15 tell us? The Apostle Paul, speaking to the church in Ephesus, tells them that they are to be those who are speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. What a beautiful bringing together of the call to be convictional and the mentality, the mode of operation. You're supposed to speak the truth, objective, but you're, su you're supposed to do so as a Christian out of love a motive of love, not a motive of rage, not a motive of vengeance, of love. Is that an easy thing for you and me to do? Is it easy to get that balance right on every given day that we live? No, it is not. But that is the kind of culture that the New Testament gives us, that it prescribes for us, one where we would regularly tell the truth. But I repeat myself, today, in many churches, in many evangelical institutions, we have shifted from a truth-driven culture to a post-truth culture. Now, it's not that there was a memo passed around that announced this. It's not that somebody uh, popped a balloon and, you know, the truth went out the window. It's not that we all took a pill that said post-truth on it and, and that switched everything over. No, it's hard to ascertain where exactly this switch came from and who made it. But suffice it to say that, yes, we have transitioned many of us at least, many of our churches at the least, to a niceified, 
culture. What we should instead strive for is a speaking the truth in love culture where hard conversations happen. Are they easy to have? No, they're not. They're hard to have. They're hard for you. They're hard for your spouse. They're hard for me. They're hard for church members. They're hard for fathers and mothers with especially growing children, older children. They're hard for coworkers. Hard conversations are hard to have. If they were easy to have, they wouldn't be called hard conversations. They'd be called easy conversations. In a truth-driven culture, it's not just that hard conversations that need to happen happen. It's that confrontation happens. Confrontation. Why does confrontation happen? Usually because somebody is drifting, okay? 1 Timothy 4.16 is not being lived by. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Well, there's conversation that happens when that person is drifting, but then eventually, if they truly are asleep at the wheel, there has to be a loving confrontation. Now, if somebody is always confronting everyone around them, that's not a great sign of their spiritual health. Furthermore, if somebody's always confronting everyone else but can't handle uh, being challenged in a gracious way or being confronted in a loving way themselves, that is also a flashing al alarm sign. But we need to say this. For all of us, challenge needs to happen. And confrontation, sometimes rare but necessary, must occur. We have such an occasion of a loving confrontation, but a clear confrontation nonetheless, in Galatians 2, 11 to 14. Turn with me there. Open it up on your app if you would. Galatians 2 in the New Testament, verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, Paul writes, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw, Paul says, that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We learn here from the pen of the Apostle Paul of Peter's slippage. Despite the fact that God has revealed to the apostles that those from a Jewish background who have become Christians and those from a Gentile background who have become Christians are one family and no longer need to separate according to food restrictions from Jewish culture, the Apostle uh, uh, Peter has slipped into this habit. He has embraced his former ways. And he is causing people to live by his own wrong code. He, verse 12, was fearing the circumcision party. In other words, the apostle Peter was not driven by the fear of God in going back to old ways. He was driven by fear of man. And his fear of man, specifically of the Jewish group within uh, the flock, his fear of man had a massive effect. It was anti-leadership. It was leadership. It was leading people, but it was without courage. The rest of the Jews, verse 13, followed him. Because he feared the circumcision party, he caused many people within the church at Antioch to follow him and Paul tells us, even as he told the Galatian church, that even Barnabas, a leader in the midst, was led astray by this hypocrisy. It is very clear to the Apostle Paul that this is not a conscience matter. In other words, everybody's not making a totally valid choice of their own volition. No, this is hypocrisy. Paul uses that term, different forms of it, twice in verse 13. It is hypocritical to say that you are following Jesus Christ, but try to subject people to the old food laws such that the Gentiles are left out, excluded, and in a lesser place effectively. So that is the basic outlay of the situation that Paul sees occurring in Antioch. 
And note that verse 11 is unsparing in the badness of this situation. Cephas stood condemned. Cephas was condemned for his behavior. He stood condemned. The New Testament is indicating to us that, again, this isn't a matter of a judgment call on Paul's part. This is ungodly, sinful behavior, such that Paul uses the strong term condemned. He doesn't mean judicially condemned before the judgment seat of God. He means here and now in this life, he's acting in a condemning way, an unrighteous way. And he's doing all of this because he fears man. He fears those who are influential in this context, in Antioch. He fears the circumcision party, Paul calls them. He used to be eating Cephas with the Gentiles. Now he has been pulled off course. Peter has allowed himself to drift, and others are following in his wake, his unhappy trajectory. What does Paul do? Does Paul say, I want to be known by what I'm for rather than by what I'm against. Does Paul say, well, you know, it'll all work out in the end. I don't need to handle this. I don't need to force the issue. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just let my general uh, body of teaching correct this. I, I don't need to address this personally. It gets sticky. People's feelings get hurt. Confrontation is messy. So I'm just going to kind of step back. You know what I'll do? Over time, I'll let slip in little elements of the truth that address this situation, but I'm not going to hit it head on because <laughs> then I might be unpopular. Is that what the Apostle Paul says? Is that what the Apostle Paul does? No. He recognizes that this is one of those hopefully rare situations where a Christian leader or a Christian more broadly needs to speak into a situation and give a godly, loving, and unequivocal confrontation. Verse 14, when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, the gospel unites, but this conduct was dividing. I said to Cephas before them all, he said it in public, he said it in front of the whole association, if you though a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul's action called Peter to account. It turned him back in God's providence. This is what the truth does. The truth calls to people. It wakes them up. It shocks people out of their drifting. Sometimes, not normally, but sometimes uh, a brother or sister, at least one we hope is a brother or sister, is drifting, is asleep, is comatose. Their heart rate spiritually is not going well, and you have to get out those shock pads, and you have to shock them back to life, or at least try to, by a word of the truth. That is what God's truth does. It calls to you. It wakes you up. It shocks you if necessary. Now, hopefully, it is not our manner that gives unnecessary shock. That is a, a work in progress for many of us. Admittedly, marriage helps us with that, a lifelong friendship, mem membership in the local church. Uh, long-time growth in, in the fruits of the Spirit, all this comes into play with handling confrontation well, let that be said. Nonetheless, the truth is always going to be shocking to somebody who is drifting away from it, somebody who is not watching their life and doctrine closely. If the truth was familiar to them, if they were taking in truth in a needful way, like food, day by day, there would be no need for a shock. They would be living and walking in the truth, not perfectly, but consistently. But we're talking about people here who are not doing that. Again, the word I have used repeatedly here is that they are drifting. People, remember this, don't often like hearing the truth. They often don't want the truth, but they always need the truth. We all always need the truth. Paul was willing to risk his standing and his popularity to tell a brother the truth, to seek to call him back. He rejected the practice that was putting the unity of the gospel in jeopardy. P. 
Peter's conduct was, verse 14, not in step with the truth of the gospel. Peter, repeating myself, was dividing where the gospel unites. The gospel brings together those with a Jewish background and a Gentile background, all those who have faith, shared faith in Jesus Christ. But this behavior was dividing again. The Jews now are going back to their old ways of dividing from the Gentiles. Paul risked everything in social terms to put this situation back together. In our day, we have to do the same thing. We have no different call. We have people today who are dividing. How are they dividing? Are they dividing per Jew-Gentile food laws? Perhaps in some cases, but not usually. The major divisive challenge in our time, there are numerous challenges, but the major one is that of wokeness. It is the idea that if you have white skin color, you are an oppressor of those who are of, of colored skin, so-called. If you're a white person, to use common parlance, you are an oppressor of people of color. They are in the oppressed category, you are in the oppressor category. Wokeness puts the entire gospel enterprise, the entire reality of the church constituted only by faith in Jesus Christ in jeopardy. It puts it all in jeopardy. It puts it all in danger. It causes people who are supposed to be united by their shared faith in Jesus, his blood and his resurrection, and it takes them and, and groups them according to their background and according to their skin color. And the scripture knows no such divisiveness. The scripture knows no such separation. What should you do if this anti-gospel ideology is creeping into your church, if it is coming into your Christian institution, if it is taking leaders you once loved and trusted and followed captive? What are you supposed to do? I want to be very practical here, and I want to point you to six thoughts on this subject, six thoughts. And again, this is more practical uh, than my other session. This is supposed to answer this question that I am getting and many people are asking today. Many leaders are getting in different forms. What do I do if my church is drifting? What do I do if it's embracing soft words and not the clear gospel? What do I do if my leaders are now starting to preach or have been preaching woke doctrine? Let me first say this to frame this. First, we need a culture of truth. We need a culture of truth in the church such that we understand that there is sound doctrine and there is unsound doctrine. There's not just two or three major truths and then everything else is gray and no one has any thoughts left over on any other matter. It is not simply the case that we confess Christ as our Savior and then never think anything else is important. We need a broader, all-encompassing culture of truth in the church. We do not gather together as Christians in local churches because we have common affinities. We gather because we are staking our very eternity on the truth. We are gathering because God is true and every man is a liar. And we need the word of God, which rings with truth from every page. We need to be under that ministry. That is why we're there. That is why we should be there. We should not be there in that assembly, in that congregation, because there are people who look like us, people have the same salary as us, people went to the same schools as us, on and on it goes. It may very well be that there is overlap, even to a serious degree, along natural lines. We shouldn't be scared of that. A church in a given locality is probably, at least to a serious degree, going to reflect uh, that locality. And, and I don't want to freak you out if that is the case. What I think we should very much be concerned with is, is not so much the ethnic or skin color driven makeup of our congregation, but is the truth. Do the people in your congregation, do your fellow church members love the truth? Do you love the truth? Are you there because of the truth. Jesus said, John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the objective, definitive truth. He is the only way to God. And so any local church that is a true local church is staked on that holy ground. It is very difficult, though, to try to sort out issues related to wokeness 
or the softening of the church in any area if there is not a culture of truth in that assembly amidst that body. It's going to devolve into whether you are nice or not, whether other people are affirming you or not, whether you like the words that they say or not. Friends, if your church is calibrated by feelings and niceness, that is a post-truth church. If your institution is calibrated along the lines of your feelings and a general saturation of a sense of niceness, that institution is a post-truth institution as well. It's not that feelings are of no matter. It's not that we go around bruising one another all the time. I've already said that confrontation should be rare. Hopefully it should be. And if we're the type who's always confronting somebody around us, that's not a good sign of our heart. But it is nonetheless the case that we need truth-driven culture, not a culture that is driven by feelings, by you telling me uh, that you like what I say, by me constantly hearing praise and affirmation. No, I need a culture that is drenched in the truth so that I myself will be led back from my stumbling and my erring and my own drifting, even if it's not massive slippage, I'll be led back to God's word, to God's standards, to divine ethics. This is all of us. This isn't some of us. James 3, 2, we all stumble in many ways. We all do. Every week, amidst other blessings of the local church worship service, God brings us back. God course corrects us. We're not scared about that. We're not shy about that. We want that. You need a truth-driven culture. I recently heard one popular preacher uh, talk about how our apologetic is grace and basically a nice person. It was Matt Chandler in a video clip, and he made the argument in a very strong way uh, that if you're, if you're correcting people and if you're not known for a grace-driven culture, uh, then things are out of whack. And it is fundamentally true that, uh, you know, a church culture is not known, shouldn't be, for being snarky and cranky and angry all the time. That's, that's not a good sign for any church. And uh, it can be the case that strong Reformed churches could drift into that pattern. But it is also not the case that our apologetic is niceness. We should be loving Christians, and the fruits of the Spirit should be evident both within the church and without. That needs to be the case in our lives. But we've got to know that a truth-driven culture confronts us all. A truth-driven culture challenges us all and isn't always going to feel and sound nice. It's not always going to affirm us. The Word of God is not designed to constantly affirm you. The Word of God is designed to do many things for you. One of them is encourage you and strengthen you and bless you and give you that word uh, that lifts you up, absolutely. But you also need to be broken down in your sin. We all do in a gracious way. God is so good to do that for us all. We need a culture of truth. Second, we need to get equipped on these issues. That's a second framing thought I would give you to answer this question. What do I do when my church is drifting, when it's going woke? Get equipped on the issues. Don't just have your opinion formed from reading a blog and a half and having a conversation one time eight months back with somebody who is really passionate about the issue. Don't just have your preset convictions and principles. Every Christian should be a learning Christian. Every believer should be a learning believer. You don't have to have a PhD in different areas. Of course, none of us can. We can't get 39 different PhDs in our lives. A few of us are lucky to get one. But you can get equipped on issues. You can read different websites. You can read different essays and articles and reviews. You can order some books on a subject like wokeness, those that you can find. And then you can sit down, brew some coffee or some tea, depending on the hour of the day, and you can read. And you can sift what you're reading according to scripture and test it. And you can get equipped. And you should. You should be like the Bereans in Acts, in the book of Acts, who tested all things by Scripture. They heard the apostolic message, and they tested it. And that's what all of us should do. That's not being a super weird theology geek 
of the kind that there should only be one out of a thousand in any congregation or, or region. There should be a whole flock of Christians in a local church who test what they hear and who press in to get equipped on different issues they are facing. Of course, a body of elders should lead out in this. Elders should be theological shepherds. We need pastor theologians in the pulpit. But fundamentally, every Christian should get equipped on the issues. And that's, that's the way, along with being in a truth-driven culture, that's the way to approach these tough questions that you face and I face. Get equipped before you plunge in, before you start throwing out thoughts, before you schedule an, an appointment to talk it out with church leaders. More on that in a minute. You should get equipped. You should know what ideology is posing you, and you should know what the Scripture believes as best you can. Third, we need to not fear man. We need to not fear man. You need to not recognize any person by who they are. You need to not say, in other words, as you might be tempted to say, well, this pastor has been gracious to us for 32 years, and I, I just don't want to upset any apple carts here, and I want to be a productive, loving member of this assembly. Look, that's a good instinct to have. If you're always the person who is uh, a wheel that is squeaking about something that is wrong with a congregation, you're the problem, not the congregation. Let that be said. But you need to be one who out of love, speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, will graciously not fear man and raise issues that must be raised. Just like Paul said to Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely, 1 Timothy 4.16. So congregations have to watch their life and doctrine closely. So elders and pastoral teams have to watch their life and doctrine closely. And here's the deal. Not everybody does. In that case, you must make sure that the settings of your heart and your mind are not to fear man, but are to fear God. And that means, fourthly, that you will then be ready to speak truth. You will be ready to speak truth. You will do so uh, as, as one who knows that you yourself can stumble and falter. Galatians 6.1, if somebody is stumbling, the one who would restore that brother needs to reach out in a gracious way knowing that we ourselves can stumble and do stumble, paraphrasing. Nonetheless, you need to be ready to speak truth. It will not always be the ones who draw a paycheck to speak truth who will speak truth. In fact, what has happened in evangelical circles and reform circles in our time is that many who do draw paychecks, some of them hefty paychecks, to speak truth to the people of God, to give instruction and in sound doctrine, and to refute those, it's personal, those who contradict it. Titus 1.9 have instead fallen silent. They are not watching out for the flock. They are watching out for their popularity. They are not watching out for the sheep. They are watching out for their brand. This is an epidemic in our time. It is the fear of man. It is the fear of man. It is a cancer among us. Little did we know that at least a portion, a serious portion of the strength of the new Calvinism of the last 10 to 15 years was going to eventuate in a movement of silent leaders, silent on the major issues, when the Word of God tells us to give instruction and sound doctrine, to line out what is true on any number of subjects, and then to refute those personally who contradict it, lining out how they are contradicting it, not tossing off a remark that only one quarter of the church or the institutional population even picks up on the radar. No, lining out sound doctrine give instruction in it, take the people deep in it, and then refute those who contradict it. Give them instruction in how those people are contradicting it. Tell them how that is working out. Warn them about that ministry. Nobody wants this assignment today, at least almost nobody. But Paul's words ring true today. Paul's words to Titus and many other corollary warnings in the New Testament and the broader Scripture. But even if you don't earn a single cent in the ministry of truth in a local church or a Christian institution more broadly, speak the truth. 
And that leads to my fifth thought to frame an answer to this tough question. If a church is going woke, not only speak, but confront. The time has come. The time has come for you. You're a member of that church. I'm assuming that. You need to be a member of a church. Uh, see Matthew 16 and 1 Corinthians 5 for more on church membership. That's a talk for another day. But I'm assuming that as a believer, a mature believer, you are baptized and you are a church member. And if this leadership of this church from the pulpit is going woke, is telling you that you need to get on board with social justice, that you need to recognize your white privilege, that you need to confess your white fragility, that you need to see that America is systemically racist, that you need to tackle the problem of systemic inequality, that, you, that white people uh, are basically white supremacists and that they need to repent of white supremacy. If these kind of ideas are being taught from the pulpit, if books that advance these ideas are being recommended from the pulpit, if there is a Sunday school class with the Whiteness 101 curriculum or the Be the Bridge curriculum, woke curricula, then you, again, whatever your position or lack thereof in a local church as a member need to not only speak to this in a kind of conversational way, as you should, but you should set up a conversation with church leadership, where you graciously, with full awareness of your own frailties and stumblings, sins, nonetheless, confront. You confront your leaders. You do so with the fruits of the Spirit in a humble manner, but you do so unequivocally. You know in doing so that you are in good company. I said to Cephas before them all, if you though a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul knew that Peter stood condemned by his behavior. Paul knew that people were being led astray more and more by the day. Paul saw that Barnabas a significant leader in the early church, in fact, was being led astray. And what did Paul do? Paul spoke. Paul confronted. It is loving to confront in this way. This is the ministry of gospel love. This is godliness in action. This is what a mature Christian does in these kind of settings. When a church is in danger of being taken captive by a godless ideology, when a pulpit is going to be hijacked by man's wisdom, man's law, man's agenda, what does a godly believer do? That godly believer, I believe, follows the steps of, of discipline in a kind of way in Matthew 16 and ultimately tries to have low-level conversation with leaders, but if, if that isn't successful, sets up a time to meet with church leadership and confronts. You follow Matthew 16, 16 to 18 as much as you can, as much as you can. But the point I am focused on is that you don't attack, you don't burn down, you try in a loving way to speak the truth, confronting such that this church, hopefully, its leadership will hear this call, watch their life and doctrine closely, and turn back. Turn back not to the anti-gospel of wokeness or any other anti-gospel but turn back to the true gospel. Be ready in these compromised days to confront. Know that you should not look over to your brother or sister and assume that they will do so. Don't wait on anyone else. Pretend that you are trapped behind enemy lines. You are in a bad situation. In such a situation, it is natural to wish and very strongly hope for a helicopter rescue wherever you may find yourself. Uh, perhaps this has application not simply for spiritual things, but for those of us who may be needing helicopter rescue. I digress a little bit here. But don't operate in either situation as if anybody is coming looking for you. Don't operate as if someone else is going to do the dirty work. Don't ask somebody else to carry your water. You 
have a God-awakened conscience, you do the hard work. Sixth and finally for our purposes in this session. If the church leadership is determined to embrace unsound doctrine, here is my final recommendation. Leave. Leave and find a new church. Find a congregation that will stand upon the Word of God. Find a pastor and hopefully team of pastors who will preach expositorily from the whole counsel of God. Find a church that loves the truth, that preaches the truth, that lives according to the truth, that speaks the truth in love, that bears the fruits of the Spirit because the truth is regularly watering that soil. Find such a church if your church does not turn back, if church leadership will not stop their drifting. Life is too short to sit under unsound doctrine. Remember that, live by that, and answer this hard question according to that principle. What do you do when your church goes woke? Tragically, brothers and sisters, many churches are. It is not, by the way, that it is an entirely all-or-nothing proposition. This is like the social gospel movement hijacking of the church a hundred years ago, roughly. There is, there is, in fact, a multi-stage process, perhaps many stages along the way, where a church shifts from at least seeming to love the true gospel to loving a false gospel. It's not usually a one-step proposition. It's usually a multi-step proposition. It takes time. There are usually a thousand cuts and a thousand compromises along the way. Don't assume that it will be otherwise for your church or movement of churches or your institution. There is going to be a pattern of drift long before there is a whole-fledged embrace of unbelief. Part of, if God would allow, your congregation can turn back is through godly Christians speaking up. All of that depends upon a culture of truth. If that culture of truth is lost in the broader church, let it not be lost for you, for your house, for your family, for a group of you in a church. Try to win back those who are straying and drifting, just like Paul did. But if your efforts are unsuccessful, it is time to go, and it is time to join arms with a church that will stand upon the truth of God and will not compromise, that will give instruction and in sound doctrine and will refute those who contradict it. May God help all of us in these difficult days. May God give grace to you if this step or these sets of steps, the Matthew 16 steps, are indeed necessary for you. May God lift up your flagging hands as you go through this process. May God encourage you, your weary heart, as you weep uh, for brothers and sisters who once seemed sound and strong, but who now are showing themselves to not be that. May God, in His grace, bring back many who are straying and drifting, and know that He will do so through people like you who love His truth. God bless you.